Okay, moving on. So that's for the kind of cosmological argument. And again, I'll attempt to bridge that gap in a bit. The next argument I was going to use is the fine-tuning argument. So the universe is fine-tuned. That's the first premise. Very contentious premises here. And if the universe is fine-tuned, it is either due to design, chance, or necessity. Premise three, it is not due to chance or necessity. Therefore, it is due to design. So it's, you've, it's proven by exclusion, right? We can exclude chance and necessity, so it must be des uh, design. Now, premise one, the universe is fine-tuned. And we can appeal to examples of fine-tuning here. And I take this from uh, Luke Barnes, his paper, a PhD physicist. A universe governed by Maxwell's laws all the way down will not have stable atoms, and hence no chemistry. We don't need to know what the parameters are to know that life in such a universe is plausibly impossible. Two more examples. If gravity were repulsive rather than attractive, then matter wouldn't clump it into complex structures. Now, this is important because you can't say maybe another life, another form of life could occur because this excludes any kind of life. Because if matter can't clump into complex structures, then you can't have life whatsoever, carbon based, however else life you want to talk about, mysterious forms, you just couldn't have it because matter won't clump up. Moving on, if in electromagnetism, like charges attracted and opposites repelled, then there would be no atoms. Again, you can see why that no sort of life could emerge like this. And so these are just some examples of how our constants, the constants of the universe are fine-tuned because they're, they permit life, right? When they could have not. And so we seek an explanation for why they, they are such that they permit life instead of otherwise. Then moving on, premise two. If the universe is fine-tuned, it is either due to design, chance, or necessity. Now, this is just like a conceptual truth, right? Because the explanatory list, right, that you can give for um, explanations of fine-tuning, it's exhausted by these three. It's either necessity, it couldn't have been otherwise, it's either chance, we just beat the chances, or it's design. So then premise three, and this is, I guess, the most important one, it is not due to chance or necessity. And Luke Barnes, again, citing him, combining our estimates, the likelihood of a life permitting universe on naturalism is less than 10 to the power negative 136. So lots of zeros after that decimal, a lot of zeros. This I contend is vanishingly small. And so on naturalism, the universe is indifferent. The universe isn't going to pick out a set of laws that are life permitting, right? Because naturalism doesn't care. It's, it's not an agent. It doesn't want to pick out things that are life permitting. Nothing like that. It, it's indifferent to this. So it, that's why it's vanishingly small, because we're talking about the entire set of possible ways the universe could have been in terms of constants and uh, laws of nature. So on naturalism, again, indifference. So it's vanishingly small there. Moving forward. Why not necessity? Okay. So there's a few reasons for this. The conceivability of different con constants. And so we mentioned conceivability before, but to disambiguate the notion, conceivability is not like imagining things in your head. It's not a men having a mental image of something. To conceive of something is for it to be conceptually possible. So for example, Superman is Clark Kent, right? But it's conceivable that Superman is someone else because the notion or the concept of Superman doesn't include Clark Kent. It just includes a superhero. They're distinct notions. You have to observe something about the world to know that Superman is Clark Kent. So that's an example of conceivability. And it's impossible, right? And now, and this is to say that conceivability doesn't always mean possibility because there's going to be, we're going to want instances of conceivability that don't entail possibility. Like, for example, I'd like to say that we can conceive that God doesn't exist, but it's not possible. But it's a good guide to it. It's, an, it's not entailing, but it guides us to it. For everyday things we can conceive of, like humans having three heads, pigs flying, all of these things are conceivable. We have reasons to think that they're possible, right? So here's the idea. If something's conceivable, then we have prima facie evidence that it's possible. In the absence of def defeaters, then we should think it's possible, right? So that's for conceivability. And we can conceive of the laws of nature being different. I can conceive of, for example, those examples I mentioned before with electromagnetism and repelling atoms instead of attracted. 
moving forward, discussion of counterlegals. So a counterlegal is just like, it's something that goes against the laws of nature, right? Okay. Dial just since it's on there, I'll have to skip. Where's the evidence, right? So it's up to me to ask, right? What's what's the evidence that they could have couldn't have been different? If you want to say they're necessary, you have to give some kind of reason because it, it seems totally possible for them to have been different. And the universe began to exist. Is the only is this the only universe that could exist? One with rare parameters that are life permitting? This is an interesting coincidence, and I'm pretty skeptical of it. And so Timeless, spaceless, immensely powerful, immensely intelligent, personal being that created the world and designed it, which follows from fine tuning. And this all men call God. And I guess that's all I have to say. When it comes to fine tuning, I realize I don't have much time left. Um... I just completely disagree uh, that the universe is fine-tuned. Yes, sure, we are in existence in a world that is uh, very much chaotic, that could have turned out in many different ways. Uh, the, the thing is, we look around us, as far as we have explored the universe right now, we have not, find, we have not found signs of life on a single planet or uh, you know, satellites of all the ones that we have looked at. What we have is a planet that is full of disaster, full of chaos, full of destruction, and we live despite it while looking for ways to survive better. That doesn't look like fine-tuning, but perfection. One point you did bring up, and I think this is a really interesting point, is that um, what we do see is just that life is in a very small part of the world, right? And so, but the argument doesn't entail that the entire universe is going to be saturated with life. All the argument is saying is that the parameters are life permitting such that life could exist in the world. And that's what's surprising, right? What's surprising, it's surprising on naturalism. No, that's the issue because there's an indifference there. It doesn't Naturalism doesn't care. It's not picking something out. So that's the idea. It's not, we're not, I'm not saying that the entire universe has to be saturated with life. Uh, if there's anything you want to comment on that before I move on. Sure, just a quick question. Um, let's make a let's make a difference between uh, two thoughts based on the idea that the universe is fine tuned and that we that life came into existence due to what you might interpret interpret as fine tuning and what may simply be an arrangement of things. Do you conclude that uh, it is absolutely true based on these observations that there is a God, or that it is highly likely that there is a God who did everything? Are you basically asking whether I think each of these premises has a hundred percent probability of being true? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, of course not. That's not how reasoning works. When you when you go into a discussion, like most of the time, you're bringing premises that are more plausible than their negations, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I'm trying to bring here: premises that are more plausible than their negations. I understand. Right. The reason I'm asking this is that um, the fine tuning argument rests on certain uh, certain observations ba uh, based upon which we say, okay, there is a there is a chance of this happening and that happening, and based on all these different factors, there is a uh, a, a very high likelihood that this was probably uh, purposely made so instead of all of that coming into existence randomly. Uh, not only that there's a lot of leap of faith, but that's many leaps of faith to me. Uh, and you could come to many different conclusions. I could say, okay, maybe it is very unlikely that all of this was intelligently designed and planned. Accordingly, I certainly don't see it, but, sh but there's still a little possibility that it was not. So why would I use this to base my, uh, to base my faith and my entire life uh, on believing in a certain religion or in God? Because if we're reasonable people, then we accept the best explanation for things. Because the best explanation is just what we ought to believe. If we have a set of data, we have numerous explanations, and one of them is the best, then we just ought to choose that one and believe it. That That's what, as rational agents, that's what we should do. And... Um, yeah, I'll just pass it back. And when I see, uh, when I hear you say best explanation, what I, what I see there in that argument as a best explanation is not that there is a, um, a personal creator who created every single one of us and expects from us a, a certain thing. What I see is, okay, there's probably something beneath all this that may or may not have designed it. We understand very little from the universe that we have right now, but there may be something above this. I don't see how you possibly come to the conclusion there that it is the one God who is personal and who knowingly created everything for us. 
Well, the personal part comes in so far as it's an agent with free will that fine tunes and fine tunes tunes it for life to be permitting, right? That's where the agent or personal being comes in. Uh, something about want every, it wanting everyone to be uh, have salvation. I'm not arguing for that. I'm arguing for a much more minimal conception here, and I think it's baby steps, right? You go forward, and then you can argue for the next position. But the mm-hmm. idea here is that you have a, a cause for the universe and a designer. Thank you so much for that. Well, first of all, I think there is a, there is a misunderstanding, which is um, I never accepted the fine-tuning argument to begin with as, uh, as the best possible explanation or as reasonable. I merely uh, asked you certain questions about why you would assume that there is uh, one being uh, instead of an undefined number of beings or instead of multiple beings and so on. So I, I don't accept to begin with the idea that the universe is fine-tuned or that it looks like it is fine-tuned. I don't think so at all. I think on the contrary, the universe is full of randomness, full of chaos, full of imperfection. Perfection is not something that is objectively true. It is, so it is subjective. It is an observation, something that we merely say in order to refer to something as perfect or imperfect. It doesn't exist in nature. Do you want to? Yeah, I was, I was hoping you would give me a minute to cover something like that. Sure. So about um, perfection, I don't think the argument entails that the universe would be perfect. In fact, I mean, on my theology, and I don't want to get into theology and scripture, the universe isn't perfect, and it's, it wasn't meant to be perfect. And from the argument alone, you could not derive derive that it's going to be perfect. So that's not an entailment from the argument. The second one now was that it's chaotic. I think that's a very vague term. What does it mean to say it's chaotic? Are you saying that random? It's random? Well, what does that mean? If you're saying things are happening for no reason, that's just it just straight up falls because things are happening for a reason, right? The laws, there's order, everything is happening, there's cause and effect. And things are happening according to an order. There's a rhythm, there's a rhyme to the world, and things are going about how how they are. Okay. I can go on with that. So um okay, what I mean by by uh, chaotic is actually I think very simple. Um this is my objection to the fine-tuning argument because I simply do not think that there is anything in the universe that looks like it has been intelligently designed or uh, defined or, or made. There, there is no pattern to anything. Um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to randomness, I'm not saying that everything uh, that everything is completely without purpose. Obviously, we have uh, the Earth that we have right now revolves around a sun. This seems to continue in a certain pattern, although it changes all the time continuously. We have a moon that we are surrounded with, which... Uh, goes around us, which also has no perfect pattern. It, all, it also changes over time. These are pretty much the things that we can uh, say are in place and serve a specific purpose. The, the thing is, uh, there is a very wide range of a distance between the Earth and the Sun that would make it possible for life to exist on this planet and to flourish. The Earth could be at many different positions in the solar system that we have right now, and life could still form and still come into existence. There are many other planets in our in our in our solar system where life could be existing we simply do not know yet but uh because the distance uh is not that precise it could be th- there could be a huge variety of, of 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 distances that would make it possible a moon we could have multiple moons we could have just simply one satellite doesn't really uh matter what we have is a satellite it helps us function here's what, what i find very funny you look out into the world you look out into space what you see is uh, that there is a vastly simply chaos. We are surrounded in our solar system with rocks that are aimlessly flying through the through the solar system without serving any purpose at all. On the contrary, they keep destroying and simply wandering out there. We have multiple planets, multiple uh, objects in our solar system that have no purpose at all. You could argue that maybe the existence of one you know big planet protects us from certain rocks, but that is not entirely true because it also endangers our planet because it attracts different rocks th- uh, from, from the sky. So it, if we look at our solar system and what we see mostly, what we see is it is mostly aimless, uh, chaotic. It doesn't make any sense. If you look outside of our planetary system, what it seems like is that many other stars out there, most stars out there seem to make no sense, seem to have no aim, are mostly chaotic, came into existence out of chaos. The objects around them are chaotic, mostly serve no purpose at all. So far as we have observed the universe, 
what we have found is that among all the observed objects in the sky, in space, only ours seems to have found a way to function where we can, where where life has successfully developed and uh, lived for so long. So the best possible explanation here in this case, if we want to simply rely on the number of observations that we have made, would be that. In the universe, it doesn't really look like uh, you know, life was everything was designed for life. On the on the contrary, it looks like we simply exist on this planet despite the chaos that we have. And even in this planet, we are cu- we are currently talking about a possible uh, large scale destruction of the universe because of climate. Uh, we we are constantly surrounded by chaos, earthquakes, this and that. So th- th- there is no proper design to this. Just because you happen to exist within all the chaos, you cannot simply conclude that this is designed. It's just...